La parola va a Evelyn Zumaia. Evelyn Zumaia è una artista indipendente, restauratrice e una appassionata, studiosa e collezionista di documenti cinematografici e di eh, materiali di storia del cinema muto in particolare. Il tema della sua relazione è Gay, Bi or Straight, a comprehensive and historical analysis of Rudolf Valentino's sexual orientation based on newly discovered documents. Eh, eh, gay, bisessuale o etero, una eh, analisi eh, compl complessiva e storica dell'orientamento dell sessuale di Rodolfo Valentino sulla base di documenti scoperti di recente. Mi vado a sedere anch'io lì se eh, eh, Evelyn Zumbaia non si offende perché vorrei vedere anch'io il video. Thank you. Uh, before I begin today I have a brief disclaimer to read stating that all of the images and quotes from the George Ullman memoir are copyrighted and the sole property of the Ullman estate. They may not be reproduced in any form without their express written permission. My objective here today is to define Rudolph Valentino's sexual orientation in a twofold method. First, through the analysis of several key publications asserting that he lived his life as a closeted homosexual, and secondly, by presenting new evidentiary material as substantiation that this was false. The effect of the monikers The Latin Lover and The Great Lover upon Valentino's legacy scarcely deserve commentary before this knowledgeable audience here today. As we have heard over the past few days, these trademarks inspired both positive and negative public scrutiny of his on-screen and personal prowess as a lover. While Valentino's fans embraced and emulated his style and demeanor, his detractors wielded thinly veiled insinuations of homosexuality as a means of publicly disgracing him. Unfortunately, there is not time here today to fully address the campaign designed to blur the true definition of Valentino's sexual orientation conducted during his lifetime, nor delve into the broader social ramifications of this issue. Consequently, I will present this single telling headline as it appeared in the morning Oregonian on June 2nd, 1923, as representative of this campaign. Uh, it says, Valentino, model for effeminate lads, is here. Valentino's torment over this issue was well documented and has been discussed at length during this conference. When one interviewer questioned him as to why he took this issue so seriously, he replied, quote, I grow recalcitrant because of the misrepresentation it implies and because it is a printed utterance and automatically becomes a part of my biography, which someday I will not be here to defend. Despite this appeal, today there exists a prevailing belief that Rudolph Valentino led his life as a closeted homosexual and that his marriage to Natasha Rambova was one of convenience. This perception is so ingrained in his legacy that he has now achieved the status of closeted homosexual icon. I would like to state here that Valentino's sexual orientation is not the focus of my work, but I found this single issue to be so volatile and hotly debated that it certainly merited some measure of scholarly research to decipher fact from fiction. The emergence of a gay Valentino was nuanced and did not come into being through a single moment of change. The overt expression of his alleged homosexuality would not make its way into the general public's perception of him until the 1960s, when a culture of social emancipation inspired a renewed frankness about sex. It was then that Valentino's own worst fears about this subject would realize when a second attempt to out him appeared in print. On this occasion, the reports were not motivated by a drive to impugn him or diffuse his popularity, but by the enticement of monetary reward for a few authors sensing a dime in the exploitation of Valentino's enduring appeal. The most significant homosexual anecdotes involving a gay Valentino appeared in three publications, which I will address here today. 
a fictionalized diary which is often referred to as Valentino's unpublished diary, published in the La Presse magazine on February 27, 1961, and two books, Valentino, an Intimate and Shocking Exposé by Chawmank and Brad Steiger, and Valentino, A Dream of Desire by David Brett. Today there has been a dearth of critical consideration of these works, no serious inquiry into the validity of the author's claims or the profound and lasting impact these publications have had upon Valentino's legacy. The La Presse Diary was written in the first person and attributed to Valentino. In this alleged unpublished diary, graphic details of homosexual lovemaking are described, particularly with two noted Parisian men, Jacques Iberto and André Daven. In Jean de Recville's biography, Rudolph Valentino, published in 1972, she authoritatively investigates the La Presse diary. In this effort, she elicited written responses to the article's claims of Valentino's homosexuality from several of Valentino's personal acquaintances, including French film producer René Clair. All of these individuals, including René Clair, responded that Valentino had not been gay and that any author purporting this theory was simply trying to cash in on his sex appeal. Direct Veal challenged La Presse to produce a single page of the diary, which was allegedly handwritten by Valentino. She included this letter in his handwriting within her biography for use in authenticating the La Presse piece, but her challenge was never met. According to Directville, the scant biographical information in this faux diary and the many factual errors demonstrated the actual author's lack of even cursory research. Four years after this publication, an American Chaw Mank seized upon its direction as inspiration for his book, Valentino, the Intimate and Shocking Exposé. With the publication of his work in 1965, Shaw Mank assumed the rank of leading expert on Valentino's alleged gay life. Shaw Mank did have a correspondence with Valentino some 45 years prior to writing his book, but in his role as celebrity autograph collector, Shaw Mank had personal similar relationships with over 40 celebrities. Mank claimed personal relationships with dozens of stars and boasted that he wrote 25,000 letters a year to these celebrities by posting nearly 70 letters a day. Chalmank also composed country western music and would have one hit to his credit titled, I Don't Want a Diamond Bracelet, I Just Want Elvis. He also hand-stitched as many celebrity quilts and played the theater organ. But during the 1920s, Chalmank acted as publisher and sole employee of his bi-monthly movie fans newsletter. And it was through this newsletter that he organized fan clubs for some 50 celebrities. He regularly nailed his celebrities' star questionnaires along with requests for one of their personal Christmas cards, which he would reprint in his newsletter. Most of Mank's celebrities, including Rudolph Valentino, did respond to his fan club questionnaires and sent along friendly letters and photographs for use in his publication. Cha Mank collaborated on his Valentino biography with author and self-proclaimed authority on unidentified flying objects and alien abductions, Brad Steiger. But Steiger's interest in Rudolph Valentino was based upon one more down-to-earth fact. He believed that his father-in-law was Valentino's illegitimate son. Uh, this is the back cover of their sensational book. In their biography, Mank and Steiger create pages of fictional dialogue and expand the fictional La Presse Diaries portrayal of Valentino to that of bisexual. Mank's book is fraught with homosexual slurs, such as, quote, fairies and degenerates, end quote, as well as denigrating stereotypes and undocumented and sexually graphic anecdotes. Typical of such accounts is the tale of a childhood nurse sexually molesting Valentino and lengthy explanations of how as a young boy he was, quote, cruel and a bully. And before Mank and Steiger age Valentino past infancy, they have made repeated references to his genitalia as his, quote, tiny member, little fellow, tool of pleasure member, and glandular proof of his impending manhood. The book's lengthy and intimate fictional dialogue portrays Valentino as confused and weak-willed and, quote, resorting to homosexual activity only after, quote, failing to satisfy a woman. 
Steiger and Mank refer to Valentino's interviews before his death in response to the pink powder puff incident as, quote, silly, and ridicule his interest in boxing by implying he only feigned interest in the sport as a, quote, pathetic attempt to prove his manliness, end quote. The book's sexual content is such that today it is archived in the rare manuscripts department in Cornell University's Croc Library, not under the category of biography, but under human sexuality. Since Chaw Mank did have a correspondence with Valentino decades earlier, he and Steiger were in possession of legitimate material they were able to exploit. But one has to conclude that Valentino would never have permitted Chaw Mank to later splice his gracious comments forwarded for use in the movie fan's newsletter into X-rated narrative in an effort to deceive the reader into thinking that he was casually commenting upon the sordid text. Uh, for example, here in this account, we have Valentino's alleged sexual encounters with men in the Torch Club in Hollywood. Quote, the taller of the two, a husky blonde named Bob. I'll leave it up there for a moment. I recently interviewed Brad Steiger and asked him to, to substantiate some of the claims he made in the intimate and shocking expose. He replied that these anecdotes were based solely upon, quote, Chaw Mank's own memories. He said Mank assumed Valentino was gay or bisexual because Valentino's first wife, Jean Acker, was a lesbian, and he added that Mank formed this belief because Valentino and Jean Acker divorced, quote, on grounds of non-consummation when he wished to marry Miss Rambova, which seems suggestive and supportive of the allegations of homosexuality, end quote. He said Mank also believed, as many people still do today, that Valentino's second wife, Natasha Rambova, was a lesbian. When presented with the facts stating that there is no known evidence of Rambova's being a lesbian, Steiger added that he had no documentation or first-hand accounts other than Mank's own memories. He maintained that Mank, quote, did have extensive contacts among the Hollywood gay community at the time, end quote. It would seem that Mank and Steiger's work, which was so factually inaccurate, would receive little acclaim and respect. But the book today is a standard biography that is off-quoted and referenced. In 1998, Mank's intimate and shocking expose inspired author David Brett to write Valentino, A Dream of Desire in which he portrays Valentino as a sadomasochistic, sexually insatiable, promiscuous gay man engaging in trysts with nearly every man he met. Brett's biography of Valentino is not only an enthusiastic orgy of sexual liaisons, but of misinformation as well. Vetting this work revealed over 100 factual errors. One of the most notable errors is this photograph labeled, quote, above Valentino and his second wife, Natasha Rambova, and his lover, Andre Davin, in Paris in 1924, when, in fact, this lover of Valentino is not Andre Davin, but Valentino's brother, Alberto. Despite David Brett's initial caveat, quote, if Chaw Mank is anything to go by, he often directly paraphrases Mank's lines, such as Mank's the husky young escort, Bob, becomes Brett's the hunky young escort, Rob, as in Brett's retelling of Rudy's sexual es escapades here in the Torch Club. And Brett's inclusion of specific graphic sexual episodes and his listing of the unpublished diary of Rudolph Valentino reveal that one of his sources was the anonymously written La Presse article. By often relying upon third and fourth hand hearsay information, which he presents as fact, Brett claims an intimate knowledge of Valentino's sleeping arrangements. He asserts that almost all of Valentino's male friends and acquaintances, business or personal, totaling some 35 men, were all his lovers. David Brett presents no proof that any of these affairs ever occurred, and many of them are easily disproved. For example, on two occasions, from 1918 to 1920, Brett cast Gary Cooper in the role of Valentino's lover, when Gary Cooper did not arrive in Los Angeles until late in 1924. Brett writes at length regarding two of Valentino's acquaintances as having been his great loves. He quotes Jacques Iberto as being his source of information on Valentino's alleged gay Parisian life. But later in his book, he admits that his source was not Iberto, but someone claiming to have had an affair with Iberto in 1945. 
According to Brett, the second of Valentino's alleged gay Parisian lovers was Andre Dobbin, a newspaper reporter. And today on the Internet Movie Database, Andre Dobbin has a single byline as lifted from David Brett's book, The Greatest Love of Rudolph Valentino. Brett also purports that as Dobbin and Valentino apparently went fishing together and allegedly stayed in the same cabin, this is definitive proof that they were indeed lovers. One of Brett's most outlandish claims is that Valentino formatted his poem titled You, as published in his book of poems, Daydreams, in the shape of his own penis. In Brett's book, he formats the poem as such. According to Brett, Valentino's phallic format of this poem was, quote, deliberate, and his prank, quote, incensed the Hayes office. In actuality, this is exactly how the poem was formatted in the original book, Daydreams. As with Mankin Steiger's book, one can wonder how a book so sensational, so fan-fictional, and so lackadaisically researched as Dream of Desire could ever have had much impact on Valentino's legacy. But the book's publication coincided with the rising popularity of the Internet and online book sales, and consequently contributed in great measure to the appearance of an abundance of gay Valentino websites and listings. David Brett has since been hailed as a reputable authority on Valentino and appeared in an E! Entertainment Channel Mysteries and Scandals documentary on Valentino. One would question why an outright fiction writer such as David Brett would even be invited to weigh in on the subject of Rudolph Valentino in any form. Typical of the many subsequent references inspired by Brett's dream of desire was the following quote as cited in Images in the Dark by Raymond Murray. Quote, several but not all biographies conclude that Valentino was bisexual. He wrote in his private journal of one sexual encounter with a man. In turn, this quote then became the sole reference for Rudolph Valentino's induction into an online gay hall of fame. This website has since removed Valentino from their listings after being presented with the same documentation presented here today. In 2003, Valentino biographer Emily Leiter held to basically the same position as that of Steiger and Mink by portraying Valentino as bisexual. Leiter is more ambiguous on the subject with comments such as, quote, bisexuality is always an option, end quote, but she obliquely refers to the fictional anecdotes from the La Presse article in David Brett's biography by inferring that proof of Valentino's bisexual orientation is evident in a fishing trip he made with Andre Dobbin where they allegedly shared a cabin. Quote, this seems to have been a genuine love affair, end quote, she writes. But it was also be in 2003 that a voice from the grave would at last cast a new light upon this ever-expanding and increasingly dominant gay or bisexual portrait of Valentino. While researching my book, Affairs Valentino, I located the two children of Valentino's close friend and business manager, George Ullman. I learned during my first meeting with them that they had never been interviewed about their famous father's role in Valentino's life. It was also during my first interview that they presented me with a per Ullman's personal archive of Valentino-related materials which included his unpublished memoir written shortly before his death in 1975. Rich with behind the scenes, highly personal anecdotes of ev everyday life with Valentino, this remarkable document reveals an enormous amount of new information concerning both Valentino's personal and business affairs. Ullman's memoir is an affectionate and rather rambling recollection of his days with his dear friend Rudy. Today I will only address certain aspects of this work relevant to my topic. George Ullman did not directly address the issue of Valentino's alleged homosexuality in his memoir, but it was through his many anecdotes that a compelling new portrait of Valentino's love life emerged. These are a couple of pages from his memoir. For example, the proponents of a gay Valentino often claim that Rudolph Valentino and Natasha Rambova's marriage was strictly a platonic, primarily business arrangement, and that they never slept together. According to Ullman, this was far from the truth. This is nowhere more evident than in the following passage from his memoir. 
relating a desperate night during the final days of the Valentino Rumbova marriage. A suspicious Valentino had just retained detectives to follow his wife, and with hours of his receiving the detective's first report confirming that Natasha had taken a male lover who was working with her on the movie What Price Beauty, the following transpired. In George Ullman's own words, quote, Rudy, of course, was aware of these meetings because he insisted upon receiving the detective's reports. At about 2 a.m., he phoned me at my home and said, she isn't home yet, and when she gets here, I'm going to kill her. I begged him to do nothing until I got there. I hurriedly put on a pair of knickers, tennis shoes, and a sweater, dashed to my car, and drove as quickly as possible to the Valentino home. There I saw Rudy walking up and down in front of the house with a revolver in his hand. He was really distraught but I persuaded him to give me the gun and wait inside the house until Natasha returned. She drove up to the house at about 3 a.m. and upon seeing me said, aren't you the country gentleman, and laughingly entered the house. I was right behind her and when I saw Rudy coming down the steps from the bedroom with another pistol in his hand, I had to act fast and rough to get the gun away from him. When he came into the living room, he shouted, where have you been? And she said, I was having great trouble matching some frames in a scene. He then leapt at her and backhanded her across the mouth, shouting, you dirty liar. Natasha didn't cry, although her lip was swelling. She sat stoically just glaring at Rudy, who had to be restrained from attacking her again. Rudy told her that he was going to divorce her, named her Paramore, and told her some th of the things he read in the reports from the detective agency. All the while, she was silent and apparently unrepentant. I then asked them both if they wanted to be alone, but both Rudy and Natasha wouldn't consider that and began to discuss the matter of a divorce. She seemed more anxious than he, I presume, from the indignity of the hard slap, but we did begin to talk of prop the division of properties. At about 4 a.m., I left for my home. Before going, I took Rudy aside and told him not to occupy the bed with Natasha that night, but to sleep on the couch in the living room, which he promised he would do. I went home and prepared a brief property settlement agreement, and without any sleep at all, drove back to the Valentino house. There they were, enjoying a cozy breakfast together. Rudy told me that they had reconciled soon after I left and spent the night together. He said that Natasha had explained to him that she did not have an affair, with this man and that her reason for the meetings was only that she had tried to help him with his marital problems. It was a bold bluff on Natasha's behalf, but it worked with Rudy for a time, at least." End quote. This single episode reveals the emotional authenticity of Valentino and Rambova's relationship and serves as testimony that this marriage was not platonic and not always convenient. And while traveling with Valentino and Rambova on the Mineral Lava Tour in 1923, Ullman's sleeping berth on the train directly adjoined the couple's private quarters. Again, I quote, The bedroom I wished to use was adjacent to the Valentino's bedroom, and when Natasha's aunt, Mrs. Teresa Warner, joined us, she occupied the compartment. Unlike the authors who years after the fact claimed some critical vantage point to Valentino's sleeping arrangements, Ullman was there and had one. According to George Ullman, Valentino slept in the same bed with his wife, Natasha Rambova. And Ullman relates that in the days immediately following the Valentino separation, Valentino demonstrated little modesty while being physically affectionate with his girlfriends. This lack of discretion was evident in his love affair with movie star Paula Negri. Paula Negri evidently spent many nights sleeping with Valentino in his master bedroom in the months prior to his death, and after his death, her lingerie and negligees were found in his dresser and closet. Again, Ullman's accounts reveal the veracity of the Valentino-Negri relationship. On one occasion, he relates a hectic evening of negotiations with United Artists Joe Considine. Valentino was visiting Paula Negri that night, so Ullman spent the evening driving between his home, where he awaited Considine's phone calls, and Negri's home to relay the details of the impending, impending second contract with United Artists with Valentino. When a deal was finally struck, Ullman arrived at the Negri residence to share the news, I quote. I hurried back to see Rudy at Pola's house, and the picture that I saw I shall never forget. They evidently had been quarreling ever since I left. He was pacing back and forth across the living room, and she was going up the stairs. 
When I told him the good news, he looked up at Pola and said, you son of a bitch, and then abruptly left the house with me, end quote. It was fairly apparent that Ullman was not fond of Pola Negri, and he was adamant that Valentino had no intention of ever marrying her. The following took place in the final days of Valentino's life, again in Ullman's words, quote, they, Negri and Valentino, did have several telephone conversations while he was at the Ambassador Hotel in New York and she in Hollywood. I didn't try to listen to his words until one night at about 12 o'clock midnight which was nine o'clock in Hollywood. Angry words were being spoken, and Rudy became quite upset. The last words he ever said to Pola were, quote, well, you can go to hell, before he slammed on the receiver. He only told me something to the effect that she could go out with that so-called prince if she wants to, but not me. These were the last words he ever spoke to Pola, ever spoken to Pola by Rudy. In June of 1927, Pola married her prince, Sergei Midvani. End quote. So, yes, Pola Negri apparently was two-timing the chic. Further evidence challenging the portrait of a gay or bisexual Valentino was uncovered during my vetting of the Alman archive. This lengthy process resulted in my recovery of a cache of some 400 documents, with most of this material being unreferenced by any previous Valentino biographer. Typical of these documents, the original contract signed between Valentino and Ullman, ledgers revealing Valentino's assets and liabilities, uh, Valentino's will and other relevant documents, and the gray books or falcon hair lair household ledgers, and these include some of Valentino's personal expense accounts. Through this additional body of material, I was able to verify many of Allman's claims. For example, he details several of Valentino's brushes with the law while he was intoxicated and in the company of female dates in the months prior to his death. These allegations of Valentino's heavy drinking during this time are verified by the entries in his personal gray books labeled liquor. Um, in the month of April 1926, Valentino paid his loyal bootleggers a total of $1,102.50. By today's exchange rate, this would convert to 10 times this amount, or $11,000. According to Ullman, in the final months of Valentino's life, his reckless driving and carousing with women was often fueled by quantities of bootleg scotch whiskey. Valentino's indiscretions became so frequent during this time frame that it became necessary for Ullman to retain three publicity men on the payroll to prevent the incidents from being covered by the press. And one of Ullman's most astonishing clarifications concerns the prevalent belief that Andre Dobbin was Valentino's greatest love. Ullman discloses that when Monsieur Dobbin visited New York, he lived at the Valentino's expense and unknown to them at the time, he borrowed huge sums of money from their friends, which he never repaid. He also charged on credit, without Valentino's knowledge, a substantial bill for a complete reconstruction of his teeth with the Valentino's dentist. Neither Valentino nor Rombova knew about this until the day the bill arrived. By then, Dobbin had left New York and was traveling back to Paris. Valentino was livid that an ungrateful Dobbin would leave New York without notice, and furious when Ullman presented him with a steep dental bill. David Brett and Emily Leiter claimed that Dobbin's abrupt departure from New York was due to a lover's spat with Valentino. But the actual reason for the bad blood upon Dobbin's departure was not a lover's quarrel, but an effort to avoid payment for his costly dental work. Valentino demanded that Ullman forward the bill to Dobbin, and Dobbin promptly responded by refusing to pay the bill. He claimed that the Valentinos had failed to deliver on his movie career, and he felt they owed him money for his time lost. Although the Ullman Archive contributed significantly to the clarification of Valentino's heterosexuality, this was not my sole source of authoritative reference. I conducted many interviews with retired Hollywood producer and close friend of the Valentino family, William Self who knew many in Valentino's world, including his first wife, Jean Acker, publicist Robert Flory, and cameraman Paul Ivanoe. 
William Self was adamant that they were all, including Valentino's brother, Alberto, angered over the misrepresentation of Valentino as gay or bisexual. The list of women Valentino bedded, who kissed and eagerly told, is a long one. The claimants are not always credible, but by and large they stand as an impressive body of work, as it were. The list includes Nidinaldi, an afternoon tryst aboard Valentino's yacht was overheard by Mont Westmore, Pola Negri and Ziegfeld Folly Marion Benda, while the list of men personally claiming a love affair with Valentino does not exist. And any lingering questions concerning Valentino's possible affair with actress May Murray are put to rest with Ullman's simple commentary on a night out on the town with Valentino. I quote, one time he and I went to the boxing matches alone in his car. <clears throat> As we emerged after the events, he spotted Mae Murray walking toward the parking lot. He invited her into his car where he hugged and kissed her passionately and then drove off with her leaving me there without transportation. But I couldn't blame him. There are more revelations I would like to share with you today, but due to the time restrictions here at this conference, they will have to remain undisclosed until my book is published in the near future. <clears throat> in conclusion, the proposal that Valentino gay was gay lacks any credible source material. On the other hand, the account of George Ullman, who was a friend and spectator in Valentino's life, provides ample evidence of the movie star's unqualified heterosexuality. Theorists and speculators would be hard-pressed to match the amazing account of one who was there. Thank you. Bene, credo che dobbiamo tutti ringraziare Evelyn Zumaia per questa documentazione che in qualche modo uh, rimette in radicale discussione molte delle cose che eh, molti pensavano di sapere su Rodolfo Valentino e anche molti degli Aumma Um che circondano la sua figura quando se ne parla. D'altra parte ci sono anche cose inquietanti che emergono, un consumo degli attuali 11.000 dollari di liquori in così pochi giorni sono effettivamente abbastanza sconcertanti. Come? Da vecchie parti, indubbiamente ed, erano, ed, erano anche, ed era anche l'epoca del proibizionismo, però i dati comunque sono interessanti e da capire. Ehm, a questo punto credo che sia eh, il momento per aprire una discussione che eh, spero che sia vivace. Abbiamo direi almeno una mezz'ora ma potenzialmente anche di più. Scusa Giulia, dimmi. Mezz'ora, mezz'ora. Ecco. Perfetto. Mezz'ora, mezzo, diciamo mezz'ora e poi vediamo. Dunque, io ho conosciuto tantissima gente, mio suocero per esempio ha conosciuto Rodolfo Valentini prima di andare in America e tanta altra gente io ho conosciuto. Io sono nato nel 1930 e diciamo, ho avuto la possibilità eh, di conoscere tanta gente che ha conosciuto Rodolfo Valentini, sia prima di partire e tanta gente italo-americana e americana di tutto il mondo vissuto in America, che non erano neanche tutti americani, che parlavano di Rodolfo Valentino. Qualcuno, tanti parlavano bene, soprattutto le donne, attrici che hanno lavorato assieme a Rodolfo Valentino. Qualcuno parlava male, <ride> ma lì poi Rodolfo Valentino era un uomo gentile, diceva il mio suocero, un uomo che era educato, non rispondeva mai male, dice bisogna avere pazienza, capire tanta gente che... <ride> Quindi compativa anche, se andiamo a vedere. Lui non ha mai detto queste parole, ma lasciava perdere. Ma c'erano dei paesani, suoi amici, per esempio, che io l'ho conosciuto qualcuno, Angelino il barbiere, <ride> che qualcuno che gli parlava male diceva, Vaglio, ma tu fai la chiappa mosca di mestiere. La chiappa mosca è un credulone che acchiappa le mosche quando cammina con la bocca aperta. Attenzione, che se ne acchiappa troppo Mosca, ti affochi. <ride> eh, ma mi hanno detto, ma non essere credulone, se no muore affogato. <ride> poi, ma c'era qualche altro che poi là, la gente paesana, 
non erano gentili come Rodolfo Valentino, erano rozzi e anche cattivi. Ma perché non ti guardi quelle cose lì lunghe che arrivano a New York e poi tornano qua e ti cecano gli occhi? Dici questo perché sei uno di quelli? Diciamo, nel, nel parlare povero, io ho sentito queste discussioni mentre ero adolescente. Poi un'attrice greca che è arrivata assieme a una signora di, Valen eh, di Avellino che hanno conosciuto Rodolfo Valentino. Sentivano fare questi ragionamenti. Dice, ma non credete a queste balle, che queste qua sono invidiosi. Lì c'è un'invidia in un venire. E poi ci sono quella gente tradita dalle mogli che adesso vogliono vendicarsi. <ride> vogliono vendicarsi perché quello non ha fatto molte corna. <ride> e allora c'è l'invidia, ma c'è anche, diciamo, l'offesa, perché involontariamente queste donne andavano volontariamente a abbracciare Rodolfo Valentino, senza che nessuno glielo diceva, ma basta conoscere che poi la credivano. Ecco, queste cose qua io le ho sentite, ma da tanta gente, da migliaia di gente, soprattutto di donne, ma le donne parlavano tutte bene, c'era soltanto qualcuno che, quando Rodolfo Valentino non era ancora Rodolfo Valentino, che andava a ballare e, e si spartevano il guadagno tra lui e il padrone della sala da ballo, ha conosciuto delle donne importanti che prima se l'ha fatto con la mamma, poi con la, con la figlia, poi il figlio si è sposato con la moglie del figlio. Quello parlava male, è logico che parlava male, perché era cornuto di quattro, di, di quattro generazioni. Ecco. La ringrazio, la ringrazio molto. Quei creduloni ci sono ancora. Ecco, benissimo. Ma Rodolfo Valentino ha portato onore all'Italia. Ogni giovane da 20 a 50 anni vorrebbe essere Rodolfo Valentino. Va Quindi, bene. non solo in Italia, ma in tutto il mondo. La, la ringrazio per questa, diciamo così, testimonianza eh, che aggiunge eh, anche... Sì, no, no, che aggiunge anche, come dire, un, un elemento narrativo alla al racconto che ci riportava Rebecca dei, dei bar di eh, Castellaneta o di Taranto rivisitazione ecco, ecco il signore ci ha, ci ha raccontato anche di Angelino il barbiere adesso vediamo se ci sono anche altri interventi sì. la ringrazio ecco adesso sentiamo se ci sono altri interventi prego 